I'll never forget sitting through a middle school world history class where we were talking about Europe and its history. The teacher was sharing with us the difference between the nobility and the serf, how the serf were the property of the nobility, essentially. And one girl stood up and said, So does that mean all women were serfs? I at first thought this was hilarious, but as I went through my schooling, I came to find there's a common theme with how we look at women in history, particularly medieval history. There are two extremes I've heard from the rabid feminist. One is that women were nothing more than property, arranged marriages were the only thing a woman had to look forward to, and after that they were glorified baby makers who were mistreated by their husbands, the government, and the church. The other extreme is that women were bastions of freedom, liberty, and beloved by everyone. Knights devoted their lives to protecting women, and somehow, by the time of the Americas, somehow men decided they don't like women anymore and decided to oppress us. Well, both extremes are incredibly misleading, dishonest, and worse, harmful to our understanding of history. So today we're going to actually discuss what was it like for women in the medieval world. We'll discuss what their day-to-day -day life might look like, how they were treated, and what rights they had. We'll also discuss arranged marriages and what that actually meant for women and for men, and we're going to talk about what people really don't understand about the position of women and men at this time period. So let's talk about women of the medieval age. Firstly, let's talk about what society looked like in the medieval age, because that's important. The medieval ages can be broken into three eras. The early Middle Ages from 476 to 1000 AD, the High Middle Ages from 1000 AD to 1200 AD, and the Late Middle Ages from 1200 AD to 1500 AD. We'll be analyzing all three periods when discussing women. Let's also talk about the three different social classes at that time that women might fall into. There were the upper class or nobility, also called women of the court. There were the lower class peasants or serfs. And finally, there was the clergy. We must understand all three in terms of how women were treated and represented. Now, to be perfectly frank, the lives of men and women at the time of the Middle Ages was mostly controlled by the church and the aristocracy. Noble lords and kings controlled the land, while the church created and enforced scriptural laws. At a time of uncertainty, fear, and, well, little, people required strong government power and strong religious grounding to survive. This is how the feudal era was able to operate. Noble lords and kings controlled the land, and they would rent this land out to serfs or peasants who would work the land and pay through their labor and or goods and taxes to the king or lord that was renting them the land. Serfs were, in essence, the property of the lord who they were living under, but by this logic, the lord was also responsible for them. The feudal caste system in place was rigorous, and advancing up your, from your station, the one that you were born into, was difficult if not impossible, and that's an important detail to remember. During the early medieval ages, we see this as the darkest time for women in this era. For serf women, they could enjoy the most freedom of expression because there were not social expectations for them. Serf women, like their husbands, were property of the Lord, and thus serf women often shared the day-to-day -day responsibilities of their husbands. They might be barmaids, milkmaids, nurses, tenant farmers, or cleaners. Their primary role was to support their husband and ensure that they were paying their dues to the Lord. If a woman's husband died, then it would often be expected that the woman would carry on the business of work of their late husband. Some women at this time joined the church, but the only life for a woman in the church was the life of a nun. That being said, there were opportunities as a nun, such as the chance to be formally educated. Most priests and religious leaders didn't see any real benefit to teaching literacy to their women, but some women learned regardless during prayer sessions or from devotionals. Noble women, meanwhile, had far less freedom than you might think. A noble woman's duty was to her husband or lord. This didn't mean that she had no power, because if the husband or lord is away on business or war, she might be expected to oversee the affairs of her husband while he's away. Not only this, but noble women were expected to represent their husband's interests. All women during the early Middle Ages were essentially a part of the property of their household. This might seem like an affront to women's rights. You might be thinking, well, there it is, Raven, you just said it. Women were property. But here's the thing. Women didn't mind that too much. See, let's get something out of the way here. Being property meant that women lacked autonomy legally. If a woman did something to offend or hurt someone else at this time period, then it was the husband or father who was the one who was liable, not the woman. According to many legal documents obtained during the early medieval era, there were lots of suits or um, legal actions being taken against men whose wives or daughters had done something wrong. 
If a serf woman offended someone or hurt someone since she was the property of the Lord, then the Lord would be held responsible, or the husband would be held responsible, or the father would be held responsible, and they would be punished. Very rarely were legal matters brought up against women at this point in time. So, honestly, women could get away with a lot more. Sure, they might be punished at home, but legally, it was their husband or brothers or fathers or lords that were punished. Now, let's talk about this property thing. While we're on the subject of being property and the like, let's discuss something very interesting. This is something that many people today take for granted that will become key in not just this video, but in every historical video I do regarding such discussion. When you hear someone talk about, oh, women were treated as property, it was just so dark and terrible for them back then, oh, it was just so... Think about this. We currently live in one of the greatest times to be alive. We have access to food, water, shelter, and entertainment, even in our lowest states of poverty. We celebrate freedoms, technology, and opportunities never heard of in the past. For that reason, we have a bad habit of looking into the past, seeing something we deem unfair or wrong, and quickly calling it out as such without ever taking a moment to understand it. Which is why you can quote me as saying this. Raven's rule for historians number one, the number one rule of historical study. The greatest sin of studying history is to judge the past based on the standards of the present. Write that down somewhere. The greatest sin of studying history is to judge the past based on the standards of the present. At this point in time, the early medieval ages, the Roman Empire has just collapsed. Barbarians are harassing the people. Viking raids are becoming more common. Resources are scarce. Communication is difficult to acquire. The most important thing to people at this time is survival. To a serf woman, she cared far less about how society viewed her and far more about being able to eat that night. To a noble woman, she cared far less about being seen as property and far more about being safe and secure and well taken care of. And this finally brings us to the point of something like arranged marriages. Let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. I was going to save it for later, but let's talk about this. That evil patriarchal practice that makes women marry who daddy wants without her having any say in the matter. Let's debunk a few things about this. Firstly, while women often did end up having their husbands chosen for them, the men didn't have it much better. Boys were often told who they would marry without their approval either. And when there was marriage, quite often, it wasn't for the sake of love, but for security. Remember, at this time, it's far more important to be safe and secure than it is to be in love. The concept of courtly love and star-crossed lovers like Lancelot and Guinevere is something we'll talk about later, but had no bearing at this point in time. At this time, the more land you had, the more power you had. So a woman from a family with land marrying a husband with land meant their families could combine their land and therefore their power. Quite often, that's what the husband and wife wanted anyway, position, power, and prosperity. And before you say, well, that's still terrible, think about Hollywood marriages. Think about that for a second. Don't most Hollywood actors and performers and singers and all that marry other performers and actors and singers? Why don't they marry the common person? Well, because it is far more popular and gets a lot more tabloid news when you marry someone of an equal social standing, someone of an equal celebrity standing. You combine your celebrity status. And think about this. If someone like, say, a superstar actor married someone of a lower standing, doesn't that suddenly elevate the person of the lower standing? Aren't they suddenly reaching celebrity status? It's actually not that different. The difference, though, is social status versus land ownership. Now, what about serf women? Serf women often were married off and arranged marriages as well, but it was always done with the permission of the feudal lord. You see, what would happen is the husband might pick a serf man for her to marry, and then he would get the lord's permission because, again, they're all property. The serf man, the serf woman, they're all his, they're all his property, and he wants to make sure that the marriage is going to go through properly. He wants to make sure that they're going to be happy. It's not going to upset the status quo. They're going to be able to run their businesses as they see fit and that they'll be able to pay him through their work. So, yeah, he had most of the say in that. When you, quite often... We start, wa we start waging this war on the past by saying it was evil and sexist and awful. But before we start waging, wagging our finger at how cruel and sexist all this was, we have to consider things in context. Am I saying it's the ideal situation? No, I'm a, I'm a romantic. I'm a hopeless romantic. I believe firmly that a man and a woman should fall in love together, get married, and marriage should be for love. Quote Jasmine from Aladdin on that. If I get married, I want it to be for love. Absolutely. But at this time period, 
Love was secondary to survival. And what you needed to survive was power or a strong noble lord. If you have a strong feudal lord, then the feudal lord has to decide who you marry so that he can maintain his strength and position. If you are a noble or you are a high-ranking woman, you want to marry someone with a lot of land because if you marry someone with a lot of land, it's going to maintain power and security for you. That's what mattered more, security and safety. All right, so let's move on. As the early Middle Ages turn into the High Middle Ages, we begin to see gradual changes in the lives of women. Society in the High Middle Ages, particularly in France and Spain, saw a growth in emphasis on trade, and this created a middle-class society that were primarily made up of merchants and merchant guilds. These merchants began to amass enough wealth that they could actually have an impact on political matters, and women in this new middle class could work alongside their husbands and fathers and would often succeed them as head of their businesses should they die. And at this point in time, however, it's true that women were paid less than men. Okay, so you always hear this myth that women are paid less than men. At this point in time, it's actually true. They were paid less than men. But this also worked to women's advantage for a period. Since women were cheaper to hire, they were hired far more often than men. Many merchant guilds began to see women taking a more active role despite not being paid as much because they were cheaper to hire. Not only this, but legal documents began surfacing at this time showing that women were being fined and punished for trespasses and offenses, which is a huge step in the right direction as it shows women were being given more autonomy legally. Rather than just being seen as property, they were being seen as individuals. Why? Well, mostly this can be thanked in part to the merchant class being established and women having a larger role in it, and also to the church. Remember that patriarchal oppressive church? It pushed further and further for women to be given due respect as God's children. See, in the early Middle Ages, it was a superstition that women were temptresses and secretly wicked because of Eve, the woman who led to the fall of man. But this outlook changed gradually thanks to the church who were beginning to do away with such superstition. Now, as for the serf and the noble woman, we talked about the middle class women. For the serf and the noble woman, their positions remained highly unchanged, though they were allowed a little more mobility. One famous woman of this time period that I want to bring up, and I should do a whole video on, is Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was one, who was not only the wife of Louis VII of France, but later married Henry II of England after that first marriage was annulled, was the mother of Richard the Lionheart, took part in the Second Crusade, managed her own estate and finances, and would be a patron and leader of the arts, romantic literature, and inspired the classic literary concepts of courtly love. Let no one say that there were no influential women of the time. This lady was badass. I, wish I should really do a video on her. Now, as the High Middle Ages drew the concept of courtly love and romantic chivalry around, this began to emerge as a concept that a lot of households were practicing. What is courtly love and romantic chivalry? Well, it's the, remember me talking about how earlier love was secondary? Well, as courtly love and romantic chivalry began to grow in popularity, this concept changed the way society viewed women. It made them valuable, reversing the long belief stance that women were lesser, but rather treasured. Women were valuable, wonderful, fair. Stories and tales of brave knights protecting damsels and rescuing princesses actually helped inspire men to see their women as valuable and worth dying for. Now, isn't this ironic? A lot of people say that the St. George and the Dragon mythos where a knight saves a scared damsel, that's so patriarchal, that's so sexist. A woman doesn't need to be saved. But it was these kind of stories, it's this kind of paradigm that many feminists point to and claim is sexist, but it actually inspired men to treat women better. It made men see women as something being to be valued, something to be loved, something to be cherished, something to be protected. And this concept would continue into the late Middle Ages. The late Middle Ages saw great amounts of freedom and opportunity for serf women. As currency began to emerge again, and with the advent of currency, land no longer held as much power. Men and women could work, earn a wage, and pay with that coin. They did not need to live off the land they tilled any longer if they could afford to leave it. If they wanted to stay, they need only pay a tax and coin. Noble women also began to see more opportunity. Courtly love and marriage for love began to become more popular, and women were beginning to take the arts, literature, and music more seriously. They were seeking new means of expression. Middle-class women, on the other hand, eh, they were seeing a few more restrictions. As I laid out earlier, women were paid less than men in terms of merchant work, and this meant more women were being hired. Men who worked the field began to feel threatened as their loss of employment began to grow, and they formed new merchant guild exclusively for men to secure their jobs. However, this wasn't a total loss, because by this time, married women in this era routinely took care of their husband's business at businesses accounts and were more than capable of overseeing them. 
This would become crucial during the Black Death pandemic of 1347, when many men were dying with no one to look after their businesses. Women took up the position quickly and with efficiency, granting them greater autonomy, position, and even privilege. Plus, the church had begun to uphold a prominent worship of the Virgin Mary, with accentuate, while accentuating the virginity and purity of women. While Eve might have led to man's downfall, it was Mary who brought the Savior Jesus Christ into the world. No longer should women be shamed when they brought down man, but we should be grateful to them because it was through a woman that our salvation came. As stated by Joshua Mark, the director of Ancient History Encyclopedia, quote, Women in medieval times were not the passive victims of the religious and political patriarchy, no matter how often that claim is repeated. Women frequently found ways around the obstacles placed in their path or forged new paths when a challenge proved too great. And the church, while upholding and encouraging the understanding that women were of less value than men, made some important concessions in recognizing the value of women." End quote. I hope y'all have learned much from this talk on women in the medieval Europe. It was a lot to cover, but if you have questions, please feel free to send them in a comment and I'll try to answer them. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already subscribed, like the video if you enjoyed, the link to my Discord is in the description, as is the link to my Teespring store if you're feeling like you want to support me. Throw some bread at your boy, and I will see you in the next video. Take care, guys.